Quiet, please. Quiet, please. by Willis Cooper and featuring Ernest Chappell is called Inquest. My name is William Ross and I want to know why I'm here. My dear Mr. Ross, in all cases of violent death, it is customary for an inquest to be held. Surely you know that, don't you? Well, who are those people? The jury, Mr. Ross. And if you are wondering, my office is that of Carla. Now, may we proceed, please? Well, now, wait a minute. I want to know what these people are wearing those funny clothes for. They look more like a masquerade than a coroner's jury. You are referring to the gentleman in kilt? Well, him and the others, too. Well, who is he? Will you identify yourself to Mr. Ross, please, sir? <clears throat> My name is Duncan. What's the idea of the Scotch outfit? Sir, I'm a Scot. These are my usual garments. Thank you, sir. You may be seated again, Mr. Ross. Well, I think it's a funny outfit to wear at a coroner's inquest. Your garments may be quite as unusual to some of the members of the jury as theirs are to you, Mr. Ross. I must look pretty funny, then. That is a matter of opinion, Mr. Ross. Shall we begin? I want counsel. That will not be necessary, sir. This is not a court of law, but an inquiring body whose function it is to determine the causes of death in the case. Well, you find it was justifiable homicide, brother. I'm telling you. We shall see. You were on bad terms with your sister and your brother-in-law? They Mr. were on bad terms with me. I see, this is a state of affairs that has existed for some time. Long enough. How long? Since before she married him. And they were married? Just a few months. They've been married just a few months when this thing happened. When the murder took place. We call things by their right names here, Mr. Ross. Well, you haven't proved anything yet. We shall. You'll find it was self-defense. All in good time, Mr. Ross. Well, you'll see. Go ahead. Go ahead, ask me questions. Very well. You'll tell the truth, the whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, sure. I regret that it is impossible for us to call your sister and your brother-in-law as witnesses. <laughs> so we shall have to depend upon your testimony completely. Sure, yeah. I know. But perhaps you can tell the jury something about the causes behind this ill feeling between you and your sister, Mr. Ross. I certainly can. Do so, please. Well, it's pretty simple. Eileen was born in 1908, two years before me. There were just the two of us. I understand your parents were wealthy, Mr. Ross. Yes, they were. Uh, that's part of it, too. I suspected it was. Go on. I haven't got any money. <laughs> but what's he laughing at? Well, none of the people who come here to testify ever have any money, Mr. Ross. For one reason or another. Well, that's not funny. I agree with you, Mr. Ross. Kindly refrain from unseemly mirth, gentlemen. Go on, sir. Well, our parents were drowned in the wreck of the vestry. Uh, when was that? 1927. 1928. Yeah, that's right. 28. They left everything to us. Uh, quite a lot of money. Yes. But there was a catch to it. Address the jury, Mr. Ross. What? Oh, oh uh, well, I said there was a catch in it. We weren't to get all the money right away. We were both underage, you see. Eileen was 20 and I was 18. Will you speak up, please? All right, all right. We got we got 5000 a year at first, and we were to get the rest of our shares when we came of age. That was a considerable amount, Mr. Ross? It was. So I was supposed to wait three years. Eileen got hers the next year, in 1929. I had to wait. 
Did you wait, Mr. Ross? Yes. Well, I waited till Eileen got her share. I mean, after all, it was our money. It wasn't fair for Eileen to have that much and me not have a cent. Was it? We are not here to judge such things, Mr. Ross. This is a coroner's jury. Well, you... You see what I mean. Go on, sir. So I saw people making money that year hand over fist. All you needed to make money was some money to start with. And I didn't have any. What about your 5000 Oh, I lost that. <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen. Well, I borrowed money from her. I mean, I didn't borrow it either. I showed her how I could make a lot more money for her by just investing her money. But I don't want any more money, William. I told her if I had my money, I'd put it into investments and double it or triple it. But she just smiled at me. She had the most aggravating smile I've ever seen. No matter what I'd say, she'd shake her head and smile at me. Was that when you forged her name, Mr. Ross? I don't think that's for you. Well, of course, I'm no judge. But you promised to speak the truth, you know, Mr. Ross. Well, I signed her name to a bank draft, sure. I was doing her a favor. I was going to make a lot of money for her. Of course. And I was going to have my money in another couple of years. There isn't anything wrong with that. After all, we were brother and sister. And it wasn't my fault the market crashed. Was it? Of course not, Mr. Ross. <laughs> of course it wasn't. Uh, just uh, for the record, Mr. Ross, how much did you... did she lose? All her money. Well, not all of it right away. There was about $65,000 on the draft, you see, but when the market started to slip, there was margin that we had to get up, you see. I explained to her in words of one syllable how if we didn't put up margin, we'd lose everything we'd invested. Now, that's where the rest of it went. Of course, you couldn't put up your own money. How could I? It was tied up in government bonds and things like that for another year. I couldn't touch it. I explained that to her. And she was still unreasonable. Well, I should say she was. A thief. A despicable thief. Call me names. Get out of here and never come back. Try to throw me out of her house. <laughs> Not even a place to live. She changed her tune when I pointed out she didn't have a house to throw me out of, though. <laughs> oh, brother. Oh, was that a battle. That was when she, uh... When her arm was broken? Well, how did I know she was going to fall down? I just gave her a little push, pushed her away from me. Women are so delicate. It's too bad, though, really, that her arm was permanently deformed. Yeah, it certainly was. But is that my fault? I offered not once but a dozen times to take her to a doctor and have the arm rebroken and set again. Could have been done very easy, just re-break it and set it again. But what did she do? No, William, I like it this way. This way is a reminder to keep me from forgetting. It stops hurting, William. It doesn't hurt at all. Tell us, Mr. Ross, you received your share of the estate, all right? Oh, sure, sure. And you want to know something else? Just as soon as I got hold of my money, I... You didn't reimburse your sister. Oh, I did better than that. I took her in to live with me at my new house. I didn't charge her a cent. She didn't have any money to pay you, did she? No, but I let her be a kind of, uh, well, uh, you know, a housekeeper, you see. I thought it would make her feel better if she, uh, you know, sort of earned her keep. I have no doubt. And she had money whenever she wanted it, brother. She never had to ask me for a dime. Every week when I gave her the house money, there was always something extra for her. Five, five, ten, twenty dollars sometimes. Uh, she had no kick coming. Well, then I take it you feel she had no real reason to harbor a grudge against you. I don't see why she should. But she did. Amazing. Well, I take that back. I guess she did have an excuse for a grudge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess she did. You know, about Arthur. Arthur. Uh, the guy she married. Your brother. No, oh, that's right. Oh, that jerk. I didn't like him from the start. So naturally, you did your best to prevent their marriage. Well, I was just thinking of her. What's your name? Why, I'm the coroner, Mr. Ross. Don't you remember? This is an inquest. Yes, but you must have a name. I can't just call you coroner, can I? Haven't you got a name? Oh, yes, I have a name, Mr. Ross. We'll get to that. In the meantime, the jury is waiting to hear the rest of your testimony. Oh, yes, the jury. 
I thought there were only supposed to be six people on a coroner's jury. There's more than six people over there. Oh, yes. Well, they... Those fellas in the masquerade costumes. Listen, coroner, what's the idea of all that? Looks awful phony to me. Well, I assure you it's anything but phony, Mr. Ross. Are you sure this is a coroner's jury? Not some gag you're rigging up to make me confess? Confess what, Mr. Ross? Well, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, you know, make me talk. You are talking, Mr. Ross. Uh, it's like a convention at a lunatic asylum. That's Scotchman. Scotsman, Mr. Ross. Scotsman. And that fellow there in the bathrobe. Well, they're the coroner's jury, Mr. Ross. I told you. I never heard of people dressing up like that just to be on a coroner's jury. This is your first experience with such a body, isn't it, Mr. Ross? Well, it certainly is. Well, then we can forgive you for being unfamiliar with our procedure, sir. Now, shall we get on with our inquest? Well, uh, this is on the up and up. I assure you it is, sir. You said you objected to your sister's marriage. I did? Why? For her own good. Here she was living in luxury. Luxury? What? Well, I'd call it luxury for somebody who didn't have a cent to her name, Mr. Corner. She had a good home, her own room with a private bath, even. She could use my car practically whenever she wanted to. She had good clothes. Where would she have been without me? I was thinking of that. I'll tell you where she'd have been. She'd have been in some charitable institution. Or she'd have been scrubbing floors or something. Or she might have been... Well, let's not go into that. Yeah, that's right. And so this Arthur came along. And she falls for him. I love him. A guy I detested on sight. I love him. A guy him. with no more money than she had. I love him. I told her flatly I wouldn't take him into my house. We're not asking that, William. We'll be all right. Said she'd be all right. How could she be all right? What would they live on? You took my money and lost it, William. Wanted me to give her money. You stole my money. Call me a thief. We wouldn't need much, William. I wouldn't give her a cent. I gave her a home. I took care of her. I'd have got that crooked arm of hers fixed up. Why, with that arm, she couldn't even do the housework decently. And then she has that crust to want me to set her and this Arthur of hers up in their own home. Support them, even. Where did Arthur come from, Mr. Ross? Did you know him before? Yeah, he was in the Army. I didn't know him. You weren't in the Army, Mr. Ross. No, uh, I had a bad heart, you know. Yes, I know. I bought plenty of war bonds, though. Every week, $18.75, regular as clockwork. It is Arthur. He didn't buy war bonds. <laughs> he was in the army. <laughs> Not that the army wasn't all right, but some of the people they had in it. Hmm. Uh, isn't there something about taking all kinds of people to make a world, Mr. Ross? I suppose that applies to army, too. Yeah, I suppose it does. But I don't want any part of that kind. What was your objection to him? Well, to begin with... He wanted to take my sister away from me. That was enough to step me against him. Then he didn't have any job or any prospects. And he didn't like me. I can't understand that. I wasn't going to have him upset my way of living. After all, I'd had Eileen there with me for, well, let's see, it was nearly 15 years. I was used to her. But hadn't you ever had any idea of getting married yourself, Mr. Roy? Me? I should say not. Why should I? Yeah, I suppose you're right. After all, you had a housekeeper, someone you were used to. And I understand you were quite a ladies' man, too. Marriage might upset that, might you? Yeah, it certainly would. Well, now, Mr. Ross, we have the background for this unfortunate occurrence, haven't we? Shall we get down to details now, if you're ready? I'm all ready. Go ahead. Go on, ask me questions. Well, I think we'd all rather have you tell the story in your own words, without prompting. Well, uh, say, listen. Yes, Mr. Ross. I didn't see all those other people before. What other people? I thought an inquest was a private thing. I didn't know you had an audience. Do I have to make a spectacle of myself in front of all those people? Which people, Mr. Ross? Those people back there behind your jury. There's a shadow back there. There's millions of them, far as I can see. Who are they? Oh, those people. Yeah, who are they? The people listening to you on the radio. On the radio? Are we on the radio? Didn't you know, Mr. Ross? Well, I certainly did not. Oh, that's too bad. Well, I never heard of a coroner's inquest like this. 
You said this is your first experience. Yes, but We're wasting time, Mr. Ross. Well, what am I supposed to do? We want to hear your story. I've told it to you. Not all of it. Come, Mr. Ross. Listen. Come, Mr. Ross. Come where? Over here to this microphone. I won't do it. Oh, yes, but you will. I'm not going to talk to all those people. Yes, you are. Stand up, Mr. Ross. I've got my rights, you know. We are very considerate of your rights, sir. Just step this way. Now, if you please, Mr. Ross. Right here, if you please, Mr. Ross. You can speak into this microphone so the audience will hear you clearly. I'm not going to... not so close to the microphone, Mr. Ross. Now, sir, we will hear your story of that day. We shall supply you with sound effects if they are necessary, Mr. Ross. And we even have music for you to uh, put you in the mood, you know. Well, I don't know what kind of monkey business this is. An inquest, Mr. Roth. Simply an inquest at which you are the principal witness. You're on your own, Mr. Roth. A great many people are listening. Music, please. Go ahead, Mr. Roth. Well, I... Well, I told Eileen I wouldn't let her marry this Arthur. I told you that, didn't I? After all, I've taken care of Eileen for all those years. And I think it's... Well, I think it's very unfair of her to want to walk out on me after all I've done for her. She's got a good home. And you have to remember that she's a cripple. With that crooked arm of hers, what could she do? What kind of wife would she make? And she's 39 years old now. That's too old to start in married life. And this fellow out there is nearly... He's nearly 10 years younger than she is. Not only that, but how is he going to make a living for her? Sure, he was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. He got a lot of medals. He was a Japanese prisoner and all that. But lieutenant colonels are a dime a dozen now. And he's got no money... And no prospects. He probably thinks Eileen's got money. He thinks he's going to get some of that. Well, Eileen, you know, hasn't got any money. It's my money. And she isn't going to get a cent of it. Unless I die before she does. <laughs> and there's small prospect of that. So get out, Arthur, I said. Get out and stay out. And Eileen, you see that he stays out of my house. That's what I said. And I meant it. Well, he went. Eileen cried. <laughs> Eileen is always crying. <laughs> What's that? What's that noise? That's a sound effect, Mr. Rowe. Perhaps you'd better listen to it a moment. <laughs> Sounds like Eileen crying. Listen, Mr. Rowe. I won't give you up, Arthur. I won't, I won't. Can't be Eileen. You said that... A sound effect, Mr. Ross. Listen. Eileen, dear, don't. Don't, darling. Tell me a way out somehow. We'll work it out. He'll have to let Oh, me. but Arthur, how can we? He's got to help us. I, I know. I know. Isn't there some way we can talk to him into doing something? He can't do this to you. Darling, if he won't let me have some of the money he stole from me, how can we... Oh, I hate him. I hate him. Did you recognize our sound effects, Mr. Ross? I don't know how you did that. Well, that isn't important, Mr. Ross. You did recognize it, didn't you? Certainly I did. That was three weeks ago. That was the day that... Well, that was the day I really went into action. You remember... I came into the room. Eileen was sitting with her back to me. She didn't see me. Arthur was facing me. 
Eileen didn't hear me come in the room, and of course he couldn't see me. And... Uh, perhaps you'd better explain to our radio audience why Arthur didn't see you, Mr. Ross, if he was facing you. Oh, sure. Didn't I say he was blind? I walked right up to them before he saw me. Hate me, I said. Uh, and she jumped up in front of me. I'll show you, I said, and I reached out for him. He got to his feet, and he was turning his head looking for me, but he, he couldn't see me. I grabbed him by the collar. I'll show you, I said, and she leaped at me. See those marks on my face? Her fingernails. And she kept screaming. Hate you, hate you, hate you! He got an you. arm around her, and he tried to pull her away. Ellie, don't, and don't, we struggled, don't. and I started pushing him toward the door, and she grabbed up a heavy ashtray and struck at me with it. And you grabbed her arm? <laughs> Well, I couldn't help it if it was her bad arm, could I? Of course not, Mr. Ross. And, of course, Arthur couldn't see you. How could he? He was making passes in the air trying to find me. And you knocked him down. And threw him out. Next time I'll kill you, I said. You shouldn't have said that, you know, Mr. Ross. I know. It could be used against you. Well, I had to protect myself. Well, all right. I figured I'd fix that. I got the doctor for Eileen. She wasn't hurt bad. She just fainted when her arm got twisted. And she wouldn't speak to me. Stayed in her room. That house was an inch deep in dust. Dishes weren't washed. No groceries. Wouldn't come out of her room. I was pretty sore. I've got a violent temper, you know. I don't brood about things. I do something about them. Well, I let her stay in her room. And then finally I got tired of it. I went upstairs one morning with blood in my eye. I hammered on her door. I said, open up that door, Eileen. There wasn't any answer. I hammered some more. She still didn't answer. And I said, Eileen, open up that door. I'll break it down. I said, I'll take the cost of fixing it out of your allowance, too. There still wasn't any answer. So I got back and I slammed my shoulder against it. And then the second time... The lock broke and I fell into the room. And she wasn't there. That's right. She wasn't there. But the note was. Yeah, that's right. The note. She'd skipped out on me. She'd married that Arthur. That blind man. I thought I'd die right then and there. You didn't, though. No, but I thought I was going to. When I found she got into my safe, I'd forgotten she knew the combination. How much was missing? Fifteen thousand dollars in bonds. She stole it. How much did you get from her that other time? Well, that was different. This was stealing. I see. Well, I hunted high and low for her. I hired detectives, and they cost plenty, too. I didn't find her. I thought they'd be easy to find a blind man and a woman with a crooked arm, but they weren't. I used to lie awake nights thinking of what I'd do to him when I found him. You're making some very damaging statements, Mr. Oh, I am. So what? We'll see whether it was justifiable homicide or, or what. Well, they came back. I was all alone. They knew I'd be alone. Was that the... the day, Mr. Ross? Yeah, that's right. They came in. Eileen still had her key. I didn't know they were there till she spoke from the doorway of the living room. We've come back. And he was with her, standing, grinning behind her in the hall. Grinning, he thought, at me, at his new brother-in-law. His face was turned in the wrong direction. Blind men give me the creeps. She came in the room, and she put out her hands to me, and she smiled. Aren't you going to congratulate us? And my head began to swim, and the light in the room seemed to turn red, and I staggered as I got up out of the chair, and then she backed away from me, and I heard him talking dimly. And... William, what's and the matter? The room began whirling around faster, and I tried to speak, but I just got, well, I got kind of mumbled, and Eileen yelled. William! And I reached for that fool Arthur's throat. Yes, I did. Listen to me. As I reached for his throat, I saw Eileen out of the corner of my eye, and she was picking up an old-fashioned dirt that was on the coffee table that used to belong to my grandfather. We used it for a paper knife. She was running at me, and I was trying to hold on to Arthur, and she stabbed at me, and I couldn't let go of him because he was struggling, and she cut my hand. Didn't I tell you it was self-defense? And she kept striking at me, and I grabbed the dirk out of her hand, and Arthur was kicking me, and I got the dirk, and I heard Eileen scream, and there was a great red flash in my mind, and... <laughs> well, that's all. So, that's the story, Mr. Coroner. Next thing I remember is 
sitting in that chair over there with your jury and your radio audience staring at me. So, go on, let's hear your verdict. Go on, let's hear it from your masquerade party jury. Go on! Very well, Mr. Ross. Your Majesty? Majesty, what's this? King Duncan of Scotland, his foreman of our jury, Mr. Ross. There isn't any King if Duncan. If you will please to remember, Mr. Ross, Duncan of Scotland was foully murdered by a certain Macbeth many a long year ago. Yes, Mr. Ross. And the gentleman in what you termed a bathrobe died at the hand of a friend named Brutus. Aye. And the gentleman in the red cap was done to death by a snip of a girl named Charlotte Corday in 1794. What are you talking about, you... Yes, Mr. Ross. These gentlemen are your peers. All murder victims at one time or another. What kind of a masquerade? I assure you, this is no masquerade, Mr. Ross. Just one thing. Your sister and your brother-in-law did not die. Well, then, what's all this about? Your Majesty, the verdict, if you please. Guilty of murder, Mr. Coroner. Murder? But you said they didn't die. No, Mr. Ross. They didn't. But you did. Your heart, remember? And now I think you are my property, sir. story written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And James Van Dyke played the coroner. King Malcolm was Pat O'Malley. Eileen was played by Sylvia Cole. And Arthur was John Morley. Music was composed and played by Gene Perazzo. Now for a word about next week's Quiet Please story, here is our writer-director, Willis Cooper. Next week's story is the adventure of a writer and the characters that he creates. It's called Bring Me to Life. And so, until next week, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. This program came to you from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.